You're listening to Cannonball Mindset, a podcast dedicated to helping people achieve the most out of their personal and professional lives. The Cannonball Mindset challenges you to step out of your comfort zone and lean in to the possibility of having a life of abundance. Disruptors, innovators, and groundbreakers are all welcome. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the Cannonball Mindset. And I have had Olympians on before. I have had badass women on before. I've had incredible human beings on before. I've had entrepreneurs on before. I've had podcast hosts on before. I've never had one that has all those in one one person. (laughs) I've never had one where all of those things made up the one individual that we're sitting with today. And you will know her from her Olympic like fame. You will know her from her podcast. Uh, I know her as a friend, uh, a trusted friend, an amazing human being, um, and she is married to Hayes. I'm saying that, that, like, <laughs> That's really this, the only and, identifier. And, and, is, and she, she is Hayes' <laughs> wife. <laughs> I'm talking about the one, none other than Missy Franklin. Hey, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Chad. Thank you for all of that. Oh my goodness. I'm so happy to be here. Like one of the nicest human beings I have ever met. We're going to delve into her her niceties. I don't know. Is that a word? Niceties? Niceties. Nice. Nice we're going to delve into her niceties <laughs> and figure out how somebody so pure, so amazing, so can also be so driven to take you out at the Olympics and have so much Olympic success. Uh, but let's start first with um, at what point? At what point did you realize that swimming was something that could catapult you into this world? I would say the major turning point for me was when I was 13. So I was young. I had always loved the sport. From day one, my parents put me in the water. I was that little baby that did not want to get out of it. Mm. So I loved doing it. I played every other sport imaginable growing up. But for me, swimming was that one sport that no matter how my day was going, I would go to practice and I would leave better because of what had just happened in that water. And so I kept doing it because I loved it and I was having so much fun with it. And when I was 12, I qualified for Olympic trials in 2008. So I went to Olympic trials when I was 13. And if you can imagine 13 year old Missy, like in Omaha, Nebraska at Olympic trials, swimming in front of 13,000 people, I'm in the same pool as Katie Hoff and Michael Phelps and Natalie Coughlin and Ryan Lochte. And I'm just like, I'm blown away that I am there with them and I'm competing at the same meet. And I knew I didn't have a shot at making the Olympic team that year, but it was just that experience that really showed me I am capable of doing something like this. And so I left that meet and I looked at my parents and I said, four years from now, I'm going to be 17 and I'm going to do everything in my power from now until then to give myself a shot at making that team. Like I'm like we're thirty seconds into the podcast and I'm like captivated <laughs> by your answer. I'm like, wait, what? And so I want to go back a little bit because you're be you're a kid. You're you know you're learning how to swim like you know uh, kids teach their parents how to swim and you're yeah. floating around. And you got wing you know whatever the water wings are on. And um, at what point did you get into? I don't want to say competitive swim, but like on a swim team. Like my yeah. daughters were five, and I was like, they need to learn how to swim. Let's sign them up for a swim team. Yep. Right. I was and, the same as your daughters. Like my my wife was like, ah, you don't need a swim team. We'll just put them in the pool. And I'm like, no, let them learn how to do the, like all the things. And yeah. I want to feel safe. And so we just put them in, and they excelled and they loved it. What was your entrance into the pool into a swim team it was exactly like that so i had been in the water for as long as i could remember but the earliest age you could sign up for summer club swimming where i lived was five years yeah. old and where so was that? Where were you? it was in uh, littleton colorado centennial yeah. and so heritage green gators were my first team and i remember i was five and the second i started racing i just absolutely fell in love with the sport were you winning like when like, like you know at five like you're you're you get like the red ribbon or the green oh, ribbon yeah. or something. Yeah, the red and the blue. Yeah, right? yeah. My and kids were like, I didn't get a ribbon. I only got a blue ribbon. And then I'd run over to see the time scores were like posted on like taped up on the walls. Like, oh, this was her time. This was like, and so we, did you immediately have like a knack for understanding, not maybe the at five, the conscious strokes and stuff like that, but like, did it just take to you? Well, not to brag, Chad, but you are talking to the current six and under 25-yard backstroke 
record holder what? of the whoa, Rocky whoa, Mountain whoa, that's Swim be- League. That's, that's better than any medal you could so, ever get. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, just want to let you know that that record still, still stands. Still stands? Yep, yes. And, and you're what? You're, you're 21, so... Oh, no, 29. 29. Flatter me. That's 29. Um, I, I think, honestly, even from the moment I got in and started racing, there was just something there, and I my faith is extremely important to me, and I just truly believe that it was God's talent that that He gave me to, to go out there, and I think the first race I ever swam, it was supposed to be a 25 freestyle, but right before it, my mom said, honey, I just want you to go out there, I want you to just enjoy it, and I want you to fly, just fly, and of course, five-year-old me was like, oh, butterfly, and so I did the whole race butterfly instead really? of freestyle. Out, but I still won my heat <laughs> and you don't get DQ'd because as long as you don't flip yeah, on your right. your that's stomach right. to your back you can do whatever you, you, whatever you want, you want. Right. <laughs> so, but I do you know I think even from that that moment as a five and six year old I had that spirit where you put me behind a block and I was a competitor did did oh, so so you are you know you talked about your faith I'm very faith driven um, you are, I referred to you in the opening as wholesome. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's the word. Like, I'm, I've tried, you know, when doing my research on you and, and knowing you, and like I know you, and I have, you know, a, a, a different perspective because I know you off camera. Um, I've tried to find the right word to describe you. And it's really hard because I've met very few people in my life that were just genuinely as good as you. And I mean, and mm-hmm. what I mean by good, I don't talk about your skill of swimming or your podcast host, but just from the gut, from the heart, you know magnifies like goodness. Thank and you. so I use the word wholesome, but you, it's, it's rare to meet somebody that has that in them mm-hmm. and is driven by that, but at any point can <laughs> flip a switch and want to destroy the person <laughs> time next to you you know what I mean yeah so what point did you learn because it doesn't seem and maybe there was a point in your life and you certainly feel free to elaborate but it doesn't seem like you're driven by ego yeah but like how does that at what point did you realize in order to in order to compete Mm -hmm. I have to like want to either beat the person next to me or beat me than yeah. I was yesterday? And which was it for you? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think a couple points on it. For me, it was always about beating me. Yeah. Because I think even from that early age and as I continued on throughout my career, I realized that I couldn't control any other lane. So what was the point in me wasting any emotional energy on thinking about what my competitor was going to do or how they were going to race their race or what times they were swimming halfway across the world or right next to me in the pool. The only lane that I could control was my own. And for me, a best time was the best feeling in the sport. Like there's nothing better than being the best you've ever been. And it sounds untrue, but if it was a best time and I got second, or if it was a best time and I got fourth and didn't get a medal, there's of course that little tinge of disappointment, but ultimately the feeling I had was pride because I had just been the fastest I had ever done yeah. and I'd been the best I'd ever been. And what else can you ask for yourself at the end of the day than just giving your best? So it was always about beating me and that allowed me, I really think, to appreciate my competition because I knew for a fact that if I got out there in a pool and was swimming by myself, there was no way I was gonna get even close to a best time without the people around me that were pushing me to that level to achieve something that I had never done before that I could never do on my own. And so I think looking at my competition from a very healthy and respectful perspective, and also I think this came I think it came from my parents. I think it came from grow, growing up watching sports. Just this idea that I was going to let my swimming talk for me. I I don't think swimming is a huge trash talking sport. I know there's some instance of it. There's some sports where it's like an innate part of the culture. Mm-hmm. And swimming, it just never really was, which is, I think, another great way that we just were a perfect fit for each other. But I always just felt like why say something when I can show something Mm. like there's no need to go out and say that I'm going to beat someone or that I'm going to go this time or that I'm going to be the best in the world. I'm just going to go do it instead. So it's interesting because there's a couple of things I want to ask you about, but you know, you, your first peak was early. Yeah. Right. Your first peak was early. So you're, 
13 years old and you're yeah. at your going to the Olympic trials, but you're 13 years old and you're going to the Olympic trials. How do you guard against, was it a conscious guard against, did your parents guard you against it? How do you guard against uh, getting the ego, letting your ego not, not reading your press clippings and allowing your ego to disenfranchise maybe friends of a 13 year old? How do you, yeah. like, how do you cope with other 13 year olds who might not even know you, but have a perception of you because you're this Olympic swimmer, you know, going to the Olympic uh, trials. How do you guard against that at the age of 13? Yeah, I think one of the gifts that God gave me very, very naturally and something that my parents helped a lot with was was humility. Mm. Like, I again, just I think going back to that mindset of I, I'm going to work as hard as I can and I'm going to show what that work is doing and where that effort has been as opposed to speaking about it. And so I think even at 13, when you have that mindset of like the hardest and the toughest competition in your life is yourself, mm -hmm. your ego becomes so much less important because you are your own biggest competition. You yeah. are your own greatest motivator. You are your own greatest cheerleader. And you're also your own greatest critic. It's yeah. it's all those things mixed into one. But at the end of the day, it always just came down to, to me and no one else. And so I think that that... I loved that that just kept a very level head on me because at the end of the day, my success or my failure depended on one person, and mm. that person was me. So, so on the other, let's take the other flip side of that question. That is, did you ever feel um, maybe not invisible is the right word, misunderstood by thirteen-year-olds that didn't have the success you have, did, or did you live in a community and have a circle that? everybody accepted you for being this quote unquote swimming prodigy. Yeah. There's 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 papers about you, there's articles about you, people are following you, you're thirteen years old, you're going to the Olympics. Certainly, you know, you're going into high school and you're already talking to colleges, like mm -hmm. people are already looking at you. Did you ever was there was there a point where you were like, Yeah, this I love what I'm doing, but I wish I could be quote unquote normal. I think that came after London, actually. So I think when I was younger, it was a lot easier for me to kind of tune that out. And from that young age, like I had always just been known as the swimmer. Yeah. Like that was my identity. That was how people knew me. Like, so I had got, gotten very accustomed to that. And I think it was when I came back from London and the success that I had there and the exact scenario that's coming to mind is I was going into my senior year of high school. I had swam all three years on my high school team because I love being a part of a team. Mm. I love representing something bigger than myself. Mm. And I got back from London and I wanted to swim my senior year with my team. And it caused like an absolute uproar. And I was so taken aback by it because I think people came at it thinking, just completely misconstruing my intentions, saying like, haven't you won enough? Can't you give someone else a chance? Like. Mm. And I, I was, Chad, I was heartbroken, like devastated that people were misconstruing my like intentions in that way because that was the last thing in the world I ever even thought of doing. They thought, like, that, they thought you wanted to pad your records? Yes, like they just thought I was going out there just for the sake of winning. Yeah. When it was, I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth. It was my last opportunity to be on this team with these girls and with these coaches and do the same thing I had done for the last three years. And so I think that was kind of my first really hard look into the idea that no matter what you do and no matter how good your intentions are, you're not going to be able to make everyone happy all the time. Yeah. So I learned so much. I did what I could. I went to my team and my coaches and said, how do you all feel about this? Like, and they all were a hundred percent with me of like, we know that you just want to be a part of this team that you've been a part of for three years. It's your last chance to do this. Like we would love to have you and we want you here. And so I swam my senior year with my high school team. And I'm so grateful for that and had to come to that realization that the people who thought that I was doing it for the wrong reasons were wrong. And as much as I wanted to change their minds, it wasn't my job to do so. So, so first of all, wow. Um, second of all, let's back up just a quick second because let's give context to what happened in London. Yeah. So you go to prelims at 13, mm -hmm. 12, 12 or 13, you don't make the team. Yeah. Four years later, 
You're 17. Yeah. You make the team. Yeah. You go to London. Yeah. What happens? So I come back at 17. I make my first Olympic team in seven events. I go to London. I mean, how many events are there? <laughs> That's actually a great question. I don't even think I know how many events I, like, could, is there like, I could count is there them like, all out. Is there like but eight events? <laughs> no, you there's said more like, than that. I, you know, I made it in seven events. Like, let's give context of like, I, I know of like, there's a freestyle, there's a backstroke, there's a, like, there's only four styles. <laughs> right? Like, how many iterations? Like, so you think seven? So you it is, this? it is a lot of events. So I'll say it like this. So I qualified in four individual events and three relays. Mm -hmm. And like, normally I would say on average, people qualify in one to two individual events right. and maybe an additional relay. Yeah. And then like the Katie Ledeckis and the Caleb Dressels are separate in that they're, they're qualifying in everything. Yeah, everything. But it was a lot of events. It yeah. was a lot of events. And so I went to London and I got four golds and a bronze. And I actually missed out on two other medals by a combined 21 one hundredths of a second. Yeah. Four golds. Say it again. Four <laughs> golds. Four golds, one bronze, and then two world records as well. So, so what? No silvers? Like, no, what, like I this, never like, got what? a silver, like, and like no, now, I'm not. Now, now I feel I'm like, so bummed because yeah, it's like this like, little family, and it feels yeah, so like, incomplete like, without like, a silver. So without the middle one. <laughs> so, so what's that like? You're in London. Yeah. You're the most decorated swimmer in London. Right, yeah. decorated female swimmer. Michael Phelps is there; he's having success, yeah. but you're having success, mm -hmm. unheard of at that point. Um, what's that feel like for a seventeen-year-old? Did when you and when you went in? Obviously, you have this winner winner kind of mindset. This like I'm going to win type of mindset, which we'll talk about in a second. But like, what's that feel like when you see the last nine years, ten years of your life come to this culmination of I just, I'm walking away with a lot of hardware. It was the combination of a lot of emotions. I think joy was paramount. I mean, just going to the Olympics, being on that stage, being somewhere I had dreamt of being since I was a little girl, and then having all the stars align to was eight days like I truly was if you go back and watch any of my race videos I have the biggest goofiest smile on my face behind the blocks every single time I was absolutely nervous so nervous yeah. but I was also just so happy like, yeah. I could not believe I was there doing what I was doing so I think it was that mix of joy but also I think you have to go into those situations knowing that you're capable of what you want to achieve yeah. So it was that joy mixed with you know, kind of that feeling of, yeah, like this is what I've been working for. And this is what all those sacrifices I made were worth. And this is from all of those days and all of those moments and all of the, the times where no one was looking, where I went that extra step, I went that extra mile and kind of that belief in yourself of like, okay, I can't believe it's happening and this is so insane but also the voice that's like, no, I can believe this is happening. Like, yeah, this is exactly what I worked for. I put myself in this position. Yeah. What's interesting, <laughs> it's so weird, is the universe, because I was doing my, you know, I, I treated you, and I was having this conversation with another guest recently, where I, luckily I have a relationship with you, so I, I have context of who you are and, and what you're about, mm -hmm. but I still treated you like any other podcast guest I've ever had, and I still did my research and went back and did all things Missy Franklin. And about three weeks ago, I just Googled you and look for videos, right? And I was watching a video of one of your Olympic swims and almost exactly how you just laid out, there was a video, and I don't know what's, what, what, um, what swim it was, but there's a video of your kind of laughing and they're kind of lining you up behind the blocks. You're kind of laughing and smiling. Yeah. And I'm watching you, because now I'm watching you, like I wouldn't have noticed it if I was watching the Olympics, but I'm watching it now because I'm getting ready to interview you. And you're laughing and you're like kind of looks like you're really loose. And then a couple minutes they go through, they're announcing the, the commentators like announcing the swimmers or something. And then all of a sudden it comes back to you and you have a completely different look on your face. Locked in. And what's interesting is um, I was about 
and I was telling uh, our mutual friend Katie this the other day, um, where I I spoke at the PGA Championship in Whistling Straits or an event for the PGA Championship about six years ago, seven maybe it was longer, eight years ago, and um, the sec the first day after the event we got to go down and like walk the course and watch the watch the tournament, mm -hmm. and I'd never seen Tiger Woods play golf. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to see, I'm going to watch a hole with Tiger. I'm not going to follow him around, but I'm going to watch a hole. So the ninth hole, he's coming up around and I'm going to play the ninth hole. And I'm in one of the grandstands and I'm like, all right, the way the hole lines at the at Whistling Straits is he was, he, he was clearly going to want to hit the ball on the left side because he's going to need the second shot. He's going to need to be right in. So I, I walk down, I stand about 320 yards out on the left-hand side of the course and he tees off and he hits it within five feet of where I am. Like literally it was like rolled five feet from where I am. I'm like, this is the greatest thing in the world. I'm gonna see Tiger Woods. And this is a while ago. So he was in his prime at this point. It was starting to peak. And um, he's walking down and I'm like, I'm like a fanboy. Like this is Tiger Woods walking right to me. He's talking to his caddy and he's having a conversation. I think he was actually eating a sandwich or something. And uh, he comes up and the ranger, the, the marshal says, do we need to move these people? He goes, no, they're fine. And he, here's Tiger Woods standing less than five feet from me and he's so like loose and jovial and like just like talking like nothing's happening and he takes a couple swings and he t says talking to his caddy and then he comes and he stands behind his ball now i'm like really close to him and he's looking at the hole and then everything I, like i was watching him and then everything just changed yeah. like I had nothing i'd ever seen before in my life i'd never seen somebody so like locked in focused mm -hmm. But that's what I saw when last week when I was watching, or two weeks ago when I was watching this video of you. It was the exact same thing. It was unbelievable. It was so canny. I was so taken back. I was telling Katie this very story about you and her and about um, Tiger Woods and the similarities. What happens? Mm. What happens in that moment from loose and maybe even nervous behind the scenes, like you said, to completely locked in? Yeah. My coach would always call it flipping the switch. And I think it was something that came very, very naturally to me where, just as you said, I would be up until the last second talking, laughing, being in the ready room, being very loose, kind of keeping my mind off of what was going to happen. And then the second I got behind the blocks, I think that was just really the one space where I allowed that inner competitor to just fully break out. And I was able to dial it in to 11 and just focus on my execution and exactly what I needed to do. And for the next one minute, the next two minutes, like you weren't racing Missy, like you were racing the competitor that was just cutthroat and yeah. would do anything it took to get her hand on the wall and to beat the person next to her. And then the second my hand was on the wall, right, right back right to me. Back. Yeah, right back to me. And so I think that was why swimming was always such a safe place for me because there's not a lot of places where I can get into that almost like animalistic state of like intensity and ferocity but swimming allowed that while also allowing me to just be me too yeah. i gotta have space for both it's unbelievable and if 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 you're listening to this just google <laughs> missy franklin swim and see it for yourself because that's like that's the I, I really am so zoned in on that now that that's the differentiator between the tip of the spear and everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because any, other other people, um, they do it sometimes. You do, you are you do it at the time. The time. Like the yeah. time when it's needed. So so now you're so now you you're in London. You're in London. You just you just cleaned up, right? <laughs> like. By the way, do they give you your medals when you're there? Do you? Yeah, take the ones that you get on your neck on the podium, you keep them. You keep them. Yeah. So you have to fly home with this hardware. Yeah. <laughs> How does the hardware actually get home? That's what I want to know. Are you when you get on that plane? It's to in go your home, backpack. What in your what? In your backpack. Yeah, no. Yeah. That would be around my neck like flavor flave for the next five years. There'd be no they would have to beg me to take it off at church. There's no like I ran my first New York City marathon, the first one I did, and I came in I think I came in forty nine forty nine thousand six hundred and fiftieth place. Incredible. Right? I wore that I wore that thing around my necklace. 
for three weeks. My wife's As like, Chad, you at, have. at some point, you have to take this thing <laughs> off. Like, at some point, like, it is not okay for you to take a shower with this metal on and wear it to church, Chad. At some point, you guys. Hey, <laughs> if I ran a marathon, I would wear it for three weeks too. No so, doubt. <laughs> so, you get on a plane. So, before, let's, let's rewind because there's a, something I want to ask you. So, before you get on the plane, yeah. you win all these medals. Mm hmm. And you're, you're in London, you are everywhere. You are literally everywhere. There's, there's Big Ben, and then there's Missy Franklin. <laughs> there's Westminster Abbey, and, then, and I know because I just went back and watched all of this, right? What's it feel like walking around and people recognizing you and seeing you and knowing that you just did what nobody had ever done before which was just absolutely destroy every possible record that had been set having all this hardware what does that feel like you're 17 years old yeah there's people i watched you i watched you a couple of weeks ago at the prelims with mm -hmm. katie and i saw people running to get your autograph what people going to take pictures with you people and these are like fans and then caitlin clark like yeah. these other like super badass people and but at 17, what does that feel like? Yeah, I would say it really hit me when we got home because in London, we stayed the second week because I wanted to stay until closing ceremonies. Yeah. But I was with my family in an Airbnb. It's like it was still almost like we were living in dreamland. Like yeah. reality hadn't really set in yet. Like we were still yeah. we were still over in Europe and it all just felt unreal. Like it hadn't really settled in. Yeah. And then I think the moment I knew my life had changed forever as we were coming back. And I can't remember the airport that we connected through, but we landed back in the United States and we went into the lounge uh, for our connection and we walked in and everyone in the lounge stood up and gave me a standing ovation. What? And then we got back on the flight, landed in Denver. And as we were pulling up to our gate, the pilot came on and he said, Missy, like, look out your window. And all of the grounds crew had American flags and they were like waving the I'm plane gonna, in. And I I'm walked gonna, out. I'm going to cry. I know. I walked out into the gate and there was like 50 people at the gate when I got off the plane that were cheering for me and congratulating me. And they had like one of the airport carts decorated. They like drove us all the way down. But it was just like it it fully hit me in that moment like oh i didn't just go and swim a swim meet like i yeah, just right. went and swam a swim meet that the entire world was watching wow. yeah. and it, it was pretty surreal i think there was a lot of transition that happened in those few weeks and few months that followed and it was wild balancing being a high school senior and flying to New York to go on the Jay Leno show and going on a private plane to celebrate an event with USA Today and doing a Vogue magazine shoot and then going back home and doing AP bio and, <laughs> and AP history and swimming for my high school team and also still training because I had worlds coming up the next summer. So it was definitely... How does somebody legit ask you to the prom? <laughs> Like how does how does somebody then go? I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. I, th I think I'm yeah, on the level. Yeah. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna ask prom. Did you go to prom? I did. I'm a massive dancer, so prom was non-negotiable for so, me. Did Did you go with the date or friends? I had a high school boyfriend. So yes, he. Yeah. Did you have a high school boyfriend all through the the Olympics? I did. Yeah. This poor guy. Yeah. Like, this, <laughs> this dude. This dude. <laughs> Oh, this guy, I want to call him right now and give him a hug. I, I don't even know. I want to give him he a hug. He handled it great. He <laughs> handled it great. So, okay, so so you have this success. Yeah. Then you come back and have some adversity with, you know, people questioning your, what do what you want to do. You know, yeah. you want to swim with this senior team. So how do you, how do you rebound from that? Like, how, like when I say rebound, how do you, do what the pinnacle of the world would never be able to do or has never done, mm. right? Have that success. How do you follow that up? Like yeah. what? Like how do you not fall into this post-Olympic syndrome, this post-Olympic depression? How do you get? Like how do you deal with that? Well, I think that was exactly the thing. You know, even back then, the post-Olympic depression was not talked about the way that it is now and I think I was still so young and naive at that point and in my career I had never known disappointment so in my mind it was like we just have to keep the ball rolling so I didn't want London to be my one-hit wonder I wanted to come back at Worlds the next year and 
show everyone like London wasn't a mistake it wasn't like yeah like this is who I am this is the kind of competitor and the kind of athlete and the kind of person that I am and so it honestly I think really helped that kind of post-olympic like okay wow I just made it to the pinnacle of my sport because I did have a what's next it was like I have another competition that my sights are set on that I don't just want to do well at I want to like absolutely blow it out of the water it was my senior year so I also knew it was my last year in Colorado it was my last last year with my coach so I really even coming off the games I just immediately felt motivated to Mm -hmm. keep pushing and see what I was capable of next and how do you do I crushed it. it. (laughs) So I went to Worlds in 2013 and I won six golds. Then what? (laughs) Like what? Like what? Like what's next? I know. Then then the real stuff set in. Then then the challenge set in. I went to college. Yeah. And with that, I think a major coach transition for the first time in my career. I'm swimming on a different team. I'm at Cal Berkeley. So academics is just a whole nother additional piece that's been academics has always been important to me, but I got the first C of my life, my first semester at Cal and I've never worked harder for a C ever. And I was just like really floored and humbled by how challenging that piece of it was really going to be. And that's a piece that's very important to me as well. So went into it and swam collegiately for two years before deciding to come back home and train and lead up to Rio um, and get back with my coach that I was with when I was headed into London and, and the 10 years before that as well. And so there was a lot of change and a lot of transition and a lot of back and forth. And it wasn't really anything that I had done before in my life. Yeah. And so now you're, now you're going to go to Rio. Yeah. You're walking in already one of the most decorated Olympic, Olympians of all time. What's the goal at, at Rio? So I think my goal was very different than the goal that everyone else had for me. Uh, I think I had been through so much in those past three years that the year leading into Rio, I was now a professional athlete. So I was also trying to manage sponsorships and travel and appearances and commercial shoots on top of a movie. The, yeah, the most intense year of training of my life. And for the first time, you know, I think what happened was I, when I left college and went back home to train with my club team, that sense of team, which was always so important to me, was totally gone. Because when I came back home, I was training with the club kids again. So oh. here I am as like going into junior year of college and I'm back swimming with high schoolers yeah. whose goals are very, very different than yeah, my right. own. And I really started to feel for the first time the expectation and the pressure from other people and the media and that this Olympics wasn't just going to be, hey, you know, it'd be really awesome if you could make another Olympic team. It was, oh, no, you're going to be in Rio and you're going to be even more successful than you were in London. Like we're expecting five gold medals. We're expecting six gold medals. And I just started to let that really weigh on me. So the best way I describe it is for the first time in my life, I stopped swimming out of joy and love for the sport. And I started swimming out of fear of disappointing people. Mm. And that just rode with me every day, every day to practice. That was the only thing I was thinking about was these times aren't good enough. This pace isn't where it needs to be. This yardage isn't what it has to be in order for me to do what other people believe that I'm capable of doing. And so as you can imagine, that just took such a toll on my mental oh, yeah. health. Yeah. And then I got physically injured as well about three months outside of the games. And so I think the combination of the physical and mental distress going into Rio was an adversity that I'd never faced before. Do you think that the, 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 the mental caused the physical? I think they're very intertwined. I, I, without a doubt, think that they're intertwined and I think that they play such a huge role. It was such uh, an acute injury, but I think the hard part about getting injured in a space like that is A, you can't talk about it because you can't let any of your competitors know that you're already at a disadvantage and B, there's no time to fix it. Like I can't go get surgery yeah, right now. Just swim through. Yeah, like I, that, that's not an option. So you're putting a Band-Aid on something that needs stitches. Yeah. And then how that impacts you mentally as well. Like going into Olympic trials for 2016, knowing full well 
that I am not at my best and still having to act like it was just one of the most emotionally exhausting things I've ever done. Do you remember, so, so, so you lead, so you're, you head to Rio. Yeah. You're on the team. Yeah. You head to Rio. How many events are you going to swim? So I do end up making the team in three events. Three events. Two yeah. free, 200 back, and the four by 200 freestyle and you're, relay. And you're, you're old by team standards. Oh, right? yeah. You're 24, yeah. 23. Yeah, old lady. Right? Yeah. You're like 23, right? <laughs> 21, 21. I think. 21. Yeah. I'm 21. I'm, I'm the old veteran now at 21. Yeah. Right? And so you go to Rio. Yeah. Do you remember a time in Rio when you were alone? We were with your team, you were with your friends, you were with your coach, you were with your family, and just feeling like, I don't know if I got this. No. Every every second I was alone. That was how I felt. I remember I called my, my mom the night before competition was supposed to start because we had been through all of our training camps, and that was the thing that I just couldn't understand is my training that year had been the best year of training ever. Yeah. And same with training camp. I was training so well, but I just like, there was that thing inside me that just knew. It just knew. And so I called my mom the day before competition started and I was just sobbing on the phone, like hyperventilating, could not breathe. Cause I was like, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here because I'm about to go and embarrass myself as a part of Team USA in front of 2 billion people. So what did your mom say to you? She and my dad, the one thing they just kept repeating over and over again, they were like, honey, it's a swim meet. It's just a swim meet. And I think that was just their parental intuition coming in of, you know, I'm their little girl. And this yeah. is, you know, the thing that used to bring me love and joy. And now it's the thing that is like ripping me apart. And I think that was really hard for them to have to watch that shift and watch that transition of something that had been so good for me in the past and given me so much turn into something that was so detrimental. Yeah, it's so weird. It's so it's so powerful in the sense of how powerful expectations can yeah. can sway your life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's and I've talked about this in the past, but how do you live without these like? self-induced or even outside expectation to have for you mm -hmm. um, without it breaking you apart. And so in that moment, you are you have such expectations for yourself that there's, it's creating this, this. That even though if I wasn't going to be at my best at the end of the day, I had an American flag on my cap yeah. and it was my duty to get up there. And I had made the team. I did cement my spot. I had every right to be there and I was going to go out and do my best. And I knew my best was not going to be good enough by my standards or anyone else's. But I also knew that it was going to provide me an opportunity to be the kind of person I had always said I wanted to be in disappointment. Because I think we say that a lot, right? Like, yeah. we're like, okay, well, when things are tough in life, when that, that ideal person that you say that you want to be in those moments where truly you feel like everything is working against you and you don't understand why, like there's no reasoning behind it. And so I, I figured if I could get up there in front of all the media after every race, after them asking me what's wrong with you over and over and over again, and just to the best of my ability, still be the person that I was and knew that I could be and not make excuses and be a good sports person and be a good teammate and just accept that I'm doing the best that I can. And this is my best right now. And I'm so sorry that it's not good enough, but this is my best. Mm -hmm. And this is all that I have to give right now. You know, if I could have one little girl back home watching that and see, you know, maybe there's a way to be an inspiration in disappointment as well as being an inspiration in success. Wow, yeah. So, so, so how do you do? 
Yeah, not great. <laughs> Turns out my intuition was right. <laughs> uh, not great. I didn't uh, qualify for an individual final in either my 200 free or my 200 back. I did end up winning another gold medal because I was a part of the 4x200 freestyle relay that won the gold medal, but I was on the prelims relay and not the finals relay. So the way that that works is we often take alternates for relays that swim in the morning um, so we can give those athletes that are swimming multiple events an additional break so they're not adding another race to their roster but if the finals relay wins a medal then the prelim swimmers get that medal as well because yeah. they were a part yeah. of the relay so I was actually in the village in my room by myself watching the 4x200 freestyle relay and I saw them win gold and I was sitting on a beanbag chair just crying because I had realized I just won my fifth Olympic gold medal and I got it the next day in a team meeting. And how do you feel about that gold medal? Um, very mixed at first and now it's the one that I'm the most proud of because it took the most to get it. There were so many places that I could have just stopped. So many opportunities where I could have just said, you know what, it's not worth it like this it's it's not worth it i'm gonna walk away i'm gonna step back the medals from london are amazing but there wasn't adversity to get there and i say that not to diminish them because there was so much hard work there was so like there was so much that did yeah. go into those but not the same in terms of those moments of like truly questioning yourself and your worth and your path and why you were doing what you were doing so i think that that medal that i have from rio just it shows me and reminds me how strong I am and how capable I am. And I don't think I had those moments in my life prior to that to really understand that I was strong. Where are your medals now? In my sock drawer. Are you joking? No. <laughs> are you? I feel like you're punking me right now. No, because I travel with them in fuzzy socks because I feel like that's just like a really happy, warm, safe place for them to be. So then I just keep them in my sock drawer. They're not like hung in your house? And no. Like <laughs> <laughs> I love sharing them. It's the best part. Like they're meant to be shared. So I take them like I'm on trips, on work trips, when I do visits. So I just like having them there so I can I'm, grab I'm, them, stick them in a fuzzy what's interesting sock. Is I've, met, I've met a lot of Olympians over the last two years. And I'm like, is somebody going to show up with a medal one day? Like, like, am I going to get a picture? I totally would have Am I, I going to show up with a picture on this? But now that I know they're in your sock drawer, I'm like, hey, can you, before you come over, can you stop by and pull out a, a sock out of her drawer? Well, also, now I know you're not going to take it off for three weeks. Yeah, that's so. exactly right. You better, you, better, you, better, you better tackle my ass. So, so all right. So, so now you come back from, you come back from Rio. Yeah. Now life starts. Yeah. <laughs> you're 21 yeah life starts yeah swimming is something you did yeah what's the path tough to figure out um really tough to figure out so i did try to come back from my injury i did train mm -hmm. for another 18 months oh. to have the the epic comeback that we all dream about and physically was not able to do so. So I think whenever you have to leave a sport, not on your own terms, it's really, really tough. It's hard yeah. to leave a sport no matter what. Yeah. But I mean, I ended up retiring at 23 years old. I've never had a job a yeah. day in my life because this has been my job. This yeah. was my job. And the hardest thing about it too, is it's not like this gradual exit. It's like you wake up one day and you're you're done. Like, that's it. that's it. And no take or take parade. No, no just like you're done. And when oh. we interviewed Lindsay Vaughn, I loved how she literally described it as a death. Oh. She's like, that's how it feels like. And then you just have so much fear, so much hesitation moving forward because the, the one question that's going through your mind is like, how am I ever going to find something that is going to give me the same feeling as that? Yeah. yeah. So what do you do? You surround yourself with the best people you can, which is what I try to do throughout my entire career. And I remember I had a really impactful call with my agent who I've been with since 2015. And he was like, all right, you know, we've got two choices moving forward. You, you go like you're done. You leave the sport, you continue school, you get a degree in something else, you get your master's and you just like you go and you start over and you yeah. start fresh and yeah. you start from the bottom and you work your way up because you know, you can, yeah. he's like, or, you only at that point you were only four years behind 
everybody else your age. Yeah. Because right? you were 21. Yeah. People are graduating college at that point. Actually, only two, because you had two years of schooling at that point. So you're only really two years behind yeah. people at that point. It you, feels like more, though. Yeah, because you did more yeah. in, five, in eight years yeah. than people do in a lifetime. It feels like more. You feel so far behind. And it's yeah. that like game of comparison of just you know you have all these amazing skills and lessons that your sport has taught you that are going to be so applicable in so many different areas of your life, but you don't know where to start and you don't know who's going to give you a, a shot. You know, who's going to look at this athlete that's never had a job, that's never had an internship and just say, hey, I trust in what your sport taught you yeah. and who you are as a person that you're going to learn this and you're going to figure it out. But so my agent, the other option he gave me was we can continue to use this platform that you built as Missy Franklin and yeah. you can stay in the sport. You can stay in the Olympic movement. We can go into motivational speaking. We can continue to work with sponsors and companies. And I just felt like I had put way too much into the platform that I had created that yeah. I wasn't ready to let it go. And I believe that there was still so much more that I could do with it. Yeah. So we decided to go that route and I started transitioning into speaking roles and being ambassadors. And I think it really taught me to trust my intuition yeah. and my gut of what feels right, what feels authentic, what feels real to you. And I still, I think, struggle with this. It's something that I'm working on a lot. And I talked about this with Katie the other day of you almost live with this fear of and I don't say this to sound self-deprecating, but just the reality of the situation, the further away you get from your athletic career, the less relevant you become. Mm. And so I think I have this fear that like one day I'm gonna wake up and no one's gonna want me, no one's yeah. gonna care. And I think overcoming that and recognizing that I actually have a say in that by how hard I'm working right now and how hard I've worked since the very day that I retired to stay involved, to continue making a difference, to continue making an impact so that people do still wanna work with me and then giving them the best experience I possibly can when they do get to work with me so that they have me back. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'm just learning a lot more to have trust in myself. Yeah, and trust yeah. in God. Yeah. You know, every day of your life was charted for you before you were born. Yeah. And what was the reason that God had you have so much success mm -hmm. at such an early age? Mm -hmm. At such an early age. Because for me, I look at it, and it's, the more I get to know you, the more I've uh, read about you, the more you know I've seen, the more I hear about you, and now even more talking to you today, that it was a platform to set you up for really what was your contribution to the world. Yeah. Do you feel that now? Like, Do you feel, when I was watching you and Katie last week, um, on social media and doing all the things at the at the prelims, it dawned to me that you're both so young. I'm old, like I'm old. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, right. Like you're so young. You're so young. You have an amazing marriage. You have a beautiful daughter. Like you're like you have this unbelievable podcast now, Thank you. and it feels like you're now at the next stage of your life. Agreed. Is that is that is that like a and all of everything that's happened before this was God's way of setting you up for what your real impact will be in the world, yeah. which you haven't even tasted yet. Yeah, I could not agree more with that. So what do you think that is? What do you think, what do you think the world is gonna learn about Missy Franklin where, and I mean this with no disrespect to everything you accomplished, mm -hmm. but where the medals are the footnote. Yeah, uh, and that's honestly what I, hope they become in a weird way. And Chad, the, honestly, the way I live my life and what I think God has in store for me, and I think it's beautiful because it's so open, but the one saying or mantra that I think about every day when I wake up is, if you see a need, fill it. Mm. And that can be anything. You know, like this morning, my mom has had a really tough year, really tough year. Lots of hospitalizations, lots of surgeries. She's been doing PT three times a week. And it's so hard for her. It's exhausting. And I know how tiring it is. She just had a fall last week. Mm. So she's back in PT this morning. And on my way to work out, I just went and grabbed her her favorite coffee and her favorite pastry. Mm. And I just dropped it off at PT with her. And I made her smile. I was like, there was a need. Like, there yeah. was a need for my mom to smile today. And I was going to fill it. 
it can be actual works of service within your community. Is there a need? Is there a foster family that needs someone to help watch the kids for a while? Do they need financial support? Do they need diapers? What do they need? Fill it. But like if you have the ability to fill a need when you see it, like that is just where I feel so called. And I love that because it just, it impacts every area of my life. Like I get to go to a company and fill a need for motivation and teamwork. So I get to talk about my story and I get to fill that need. But then I come home and my daughter wants to dance around and be loved by her mom. And that's a need and I get to fill that need. Mm. And so I think just leaning into the situations that God puts me into knowing that I have a purpose in them and I have something to provide in that moment to make a difference with the people that are there with me. So, so your life and all the experiences, all the hardships, all the battles, all the injuries, all the battles, all those, God was just filling your toolbox for the tools you need now? 100%. Wow. So, so now, hold on a couple more questions. I, I legit could do this podcast. <laughs> For the next five hours, I've got time. I've got I've got the like, sitter until like ten o'clock tonight. So I think this might go down as one of my favorite podcasts of all time. Wow! Um, Thank you. So, so, so now you have this amazing podcast. Mm. You are doing it with a with a with one of it appears one of your best friends yeah. in in Katie Hoff. Um, what what about this podcast are you most excited about? Well, I'm most excited for the podcast about giving our audience the opportunity to see these athletes as the people they really are. I think that's always what Katie and I really wanted when we were competing is to not just be seen as the athlete, but for people to truly see us and, and who we were as people. And that's what we're really trying to get through with these conversations is like when you're cheering them on in Paris this summer or at a world championships or wherever it is, like, you know, you're not just watching Caleb Dressel, but you're watching Caleb Dressel who you know had a really tough time and took seven months off and is coming back to the sport and has a five month old son named August and is loving being a dad. And it just like, yeah. it encompasses the human spirit and, and who they are in their totality and not just this one piece of what we get to see them as. And I think that's just so important in humanizing them and also aiding in the athlete's journey of recognizing that their worth comes from so much more than just what they do in the space of competition. Yeah, and you've done it. I'm, I'm obviously I'm hooked on your podcast. Thank since, you. since well, we day, couldn't have started it without <laughs> since, you. Since day one, <laughs> since day one, I've been hooked on it. And what's interesting is I didn't. I knew why you were doing the podcast. I knew the the angle you had and the theory you had. But you just summed it up. We get to see the person, not the player. Yeah. And to me, that brings total value to understanding because you root. I would have, I would have watched the Olympics, and I would have like cheered for Caleb Dressel because, because he's, he's an American. He's American. Yeah. He's a fast, fast. <laughs> he's a badass, right? He's got really cool tattoos. Right. He's like, yeah, he's got some. <laughs> he's got a cool story. Um, but now. You, you're cheering for August's father. Right. It brings a different level of yeah. like support and want. And it makes it like more fun for us when we're watching exactly too, right? Because right. you're That's like it. more emotionally invested in the person. Yeah. Like you don't feel like you're just watching these people on TV. You feel like you're watching your friends. Yeah. And, and for Caleb, now he, I would think, I'm not Caleb, but now he knows that people see him not as a vehicle to entertain them, but as a human being that is looking to achieve something great in their life. Exactly. And that's what we're hoping for. But I also want to reiterate that we literally would not have been able to start the podcast without you and Cannonball. Oh, so we are that. so Thank incredibly you. grateful. You guys believed in us from day one and Thank we are you. so, so appreciative of yeah, that. I appreciate that. So all right, I, have, I, have, I have just a couple questions left. And um, so people want more of you. There's no <laughs> doubt. Like if you want goodness in your life, you want motivation. And I was, I, I I got to tell you, I was so like curious. Is it possible that somebody's this good? It's like this good of a person. Like there's got to be a dark side to her. Like there's got to <laughs> be like, are there, are there like, 
Are like people chained up in your basement right now? Is it like like are we gonna read stories about you? Like there's people locked up somewhere, and I'm like, there's gotta be. There's no way you have. There's no way you have all these medals, <laughs> let alone in a sock drawer. Like there's gotta be some like deep dark secret. Is there anything you want to reveal on this episode of Day uh, Five right now that says that's, that's like see. that we should know? Well, you already revealed the people in the basement, so that <laughs> what is your out. worst? What is your worst vice? <laughs> My worst Your vice. Your worst vice. Oh. Like, what is the what is the thing that people will go? Okay, she's somewhat crazy. I love pineapple on my pizza. That's it. <laughs> I knew it. I knew there was something wrong with you. That right there. That's almost as that's almost as bad as wearing socks to bed. I know. That's like that's I like know. that is yep. the that. That's it. Pineapple That's on the pizza. It. I love. I, I feel, won't eat pizza if there's not pineapple I, I on it. I feel so redeemed now <laughs> that you are not that you are not Mary Poppins. I feel so much better right I'm now. I'm so I know, happy like, I could shatter like, the illusion for you. Because I was my plan at dinner tonight was to get Hayes drunk and get him to get him talking. I mean, still do that. Yeah, still like, absolutely my, do my, that. My my goal was to like literally get Hayes so and like just like. Give me the real deal. What is the deal with this woman, right? But now I know. Now we know. No, nothing tops. So now you can get him drunk just for fun. Yeah, nothing so. tops the pineapples <laughs> on the pizza. Right. So besides, so I'm going to pray for you tonight. Besides Thank praying you. for your mother's health. Thank you. What should I be praying for? <sighs> Honestly, I feel like. God has been calling me to really continue to work and shift my platform in his glory. Mm. So I would just ask that you pray over the future that I have and my intention in staying rooted in Christ and using that platform to continue to not only spread his love, but to bring people into his kingdom. Mm. <sighs> wow. All right, last answer. All right, sorry, two more questions. Oh, last answer, two more questions. You got me all confused. You got me, I can't talk. <laughs> all right, uh, where do people find you? Where should they follow you? Obviously, download the podcast, like the podcast, um, but where should I, Where should people get more? Yeah, I mean, the podcast is perfect, so it's Unfiltered Waters. We're available anywhere you guys listen or watch your podcast. And then I'm most active on Instagram, which is Missy Franklin 88 um, and somewhat, I, I cannot do TikTok. That, I'm so sorry. I cannot add something else to the list. I, I, but but I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> Katie because, is pushing so hard. I am so hard. waiting because, <laughs> because I feel, I feel like you would be TikTok gold because I feel like you the do dance one dance to video. Me. I know, I'm telling you, I know. I've seen the dancing. <laughs> I saw it. I've seen you dance. Like I need the world needs more of that right now. I don't. All right, you might convince I, me. God, I, you I, might I, convince I, me. I see some of these people dancing, and I see like. <sighs> Man, the world has a voice. I'm waiting for that to come out. So Instagram right okay. now. Instagram is the main one, but the podcast is yeah. Unfiltered waters. Yeah. You got to download it. Um, all right, last question. Uh, 60, 70 years from now, when you leave this earth, yeah. what do you want your contribution to have been? Oh, my children, a hundred percent. You know, I think Kate has just been the absolute light of our life. And if we're fortunate enough to be blessed with more in the future, I just, I, I think that is our greatest legacy are our kids and being able to know that our lives, our stories, our memories, but most importantly, our love is being passed on into them for them to continue using it in their own way and creating their own impact on the world. I just, I'm already, she's, too and I'm so proud of her and the mm. person that she is and I just can't believe that I get a front row seat of her life like it is just such a privilege so I think I think looking back would just be my my child our children and then again going back to this I want when people think of me I want them to think of Christ mm. I, I lied I have one more question <laughs> so so in a couple of years, your daughter will be four years old, five mm -hmm. years old. She's one day going to 
need a pair of socks. <laughs> and she's opening a dresser drawer, she's, and she's going to go to like put on a pair of socks. She'll pull out a gold medal. <laughs> At what point do you explain to her that her mother, right, the woman that she idolized already, is one of, if not, the greatest swimmer of all time? Thank you. Honestly, I think I'm going to have a very short window of when it's cool. Yeah. I think I'm going to have a very short window of like, oh, this is cool versus like, right, mom, put those away. Yeah, like yeah, this is, right, come on, come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Seize I will it. plan on fully capitalizing on the window. But to be honest, I would rather her be more proud of, again, the, the person behind the medals than mm. the medals themselves. I want her to look back and see the difference that I was made, that I tried to make because of what the medals gave me and the platform that they allowed me to have, that it's just so much bigger than the medals themselves. Like the medals are so special and they hold so much meaning behind them, but the impact of them and sharing them and our stories just goes so far beyond the actual medal itself. Mm -hmm. I have in my basement, I have in my gym, in my basement, I have, you know, I've done 40, 40 some marathons yeah, in the last six unbelievable. years. Unbelievable. And uh, all the medals are hanging down there for every marathon, every half marathon I've done. There's probably like 70 half marathons. And um, I was down there the other day working out. And I was like, if somebody comes down here and sees all these medals, they'll look at them and they'll be impressed and they'll be like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of medals. And I had my Iron Man medal down there. And you know, your husband did an Iron Man, which yeah. is awesome. We share that. And, um, but, the, the medals don't tell the story. Exactly. Right? The medals <laughs> never tell the story. No. I always make sure I try to do a, a good job of telling the real story and the true story of what it took to get those medals. Yeah. And uh, I hope that one day you write the most epic, unbelievable book of all time. I know you've written <laughs> some books. I know you had some movies and you've had a ton of success. But those medals, I thought before I knew you, the medals were pretty badass. Yeah. But you're right. The medals tell... One percent of the story, yeah. and everything else is much, yeah. much better than the cold. And you're doing the same thing. I mean, you're using everything that you've learned, the other ninety nine percent, to help inspire yeah. and motivate and empower yeah. everyone around you and the communities around you that you get to to yep. be involved with. And it's just, it's so touching and inspirational. Yeah. I appreciate it. that's that God's toolbox. Yeah. Hey, Missy Franklin, <laughs> if that was not your favorite podcasts of all time then rewind it and listen to it again because, <laughs> because I do this for a living and that was simply one of my favorite interviews and favorite hours I've ever spent in my entire life so Thank check you. it out Missy Franklin check her out all things Missy Franklin <laughs> uh, and if you visit her house Raider Sock Tour yeah. uh, <laughs> great day appreciate you catch you on the next one <laughs>